Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. This week, I talked to Cade Metz, the New York Times lead reporter on artificial intelligence. Cade just came out with a new book, Genius Makers, the Mavericks Who Brought AI to Google, Facebook, and the World. The book focuses on some of the personalities and companies responsible for the current wave of AI innovation and touches on some of the controversies swirling around the new technology today. I hope you find the conversation as interesting as I did. I thought I'd start by having you introduce yourself, tell us what your background is, how you came to write the book. I know that a lot of the experiences began well before your tenure at the Times. And then I have some questions, obviously, and we can talk from there. My name is Cade Metz. I'm a correspondent, a tech reporter with the New York Times based in its San Francisco bureau, just because this is where all the tech is here. I live in Berkeley and commute across the Bay to the bureau when I'm not traveling around the Bay Area or various other places. And this is my first book. And it very much dovetails with my beat over the past few years since I joined the Times. AI, as people call it, has become central to my beat, if not a very large part of the beat. And so a lot of what I have done with the Times has kind of woven into the book and it has worked out well, as far as I'm concerned, at least. You wrote for The Register, I believe, and then for Wired. You appeared in the AlphaGo documentary. So you've been intimately involved with this world longer than almost any journalist out there, I think. Can you talk a little bit about how you initially got involved with machine learning and particular deep learning? Well, it happened when I was with Wired. Before I was a senior writer with Wired Magazine, also based in San Francisco. And I ran a team that covered what you might call deep tech. And this became one of our core themes. I was at Wired as deep learning, as they call it, started to take off. And the way we really worked was to find where the industry was really changing and cover that really well. And this is one of those areas where the change was enormous and in many ways unexpected and rapid. And so with other reporters, I was the editor of this section at Wired with other reporters like Bob McMillan, who's now at the Wall Street Journal, Daniela Hernandez, who's now at the Journal as well we really started to cover this area. And they eventually both left Wired. And then as I joined the Times, it was part of my pitch at the time. This area in particular needed to be covered and covered well. I think a lot of people misunderstand what AI is and what needs to be covered. And this deep learning space, and we can discuss that, is where the change really was. There's a lot of hype around AI and there's a lot of frankly, nonsense that gets thrown around about AI. I don't think the layperson understands what that term means because it gets applied to everything. But there's this real change that has happened over the past 10 years that deserve being covered at Wired, certainly deserves being covered at the Times. I think this is and will continue to affect people's lives. And it deserved a book. You and I have talked about this years ago, that so many of the people driving this change are so interesting. And the narrative, the very real narrative behind this beat that I covered at the time needed to be covered in a different way. You know, I tell everybody this is a book about AI, but it's really about the people. And I feel that if the reader can understand who these people are and can understand the story of these people that they will understand the technology uh, so much more. Yeah, and that's one of the things I appreciated about the book. I mean, I've read Terry Sanowski's Deep Learning Revolution. I've read Pedro Domingos's The Master Algorithm, which you, you mentioned in the book. And they're very much in the science, and you manage talking about the science in a way that lay people can understand, avoiding getting into the weeds. 
I found the, the stories fascinating, partly because I've met a lot of the people and didn't know all these stories behind them. The initial anecdote of Jeff Hinton selling his shell company to Google I, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, I just it's so amazing to the point where you you know you wonder if it's real, but it let me tell you, every fact in that is absolutely real and it is an astounding story. And the details like him sleeping on the floor between just on the crazy. floor between two beds. Between two beds at the Harris Hotel in Lake Tahoe. One of my first questions is the title Genius Makers. I wasn't sure whether you meant people like Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun, in that they were making machines that are, in effect, geniuses, or whether you were talking about organizations like Facebook and Google who are bringing people into this world, or if you were talking about the algorithms themselves, what was in your mind? Well, I think you've hit it, that it, it has many different meanings, right? Who are the geniuses? Who are the makers? Is it the, is it the machines that are genius, or is it the people? You know, is it ironic? Is it not? I think it it means a lot of things, and it's going to mean a lot of things to many different people. Meaning the the people who read the book, and the reason we eventually settled on that title though is is that it does show you it's about the builders, right? The builders and the makers of the technology. What I kept telling myself at my darkest moments when I thought, why did I take on this enormous project? Is it ever going to work? What I kept telling myself was, if I can just show people what Jeff Hinton is like, then the book will be a success. And I think that that applies to the whole book in that it's about these people who are interesting in so many different ways. And if I can just show the world who they are and what they are like, and what they have done, and the ideas that kind of bounce around in their head, then the book will work. And so that's ultimately what the title's trying to portray. How did you decide who to focus on? Jeff is obvious. Jan LeCun is obvious. There was not as much of Yashua Bengio in there as I would have expected just because he's often mentioned with the other two as a triumvirate. How did you decide what to pick up on and what to leave out? Well, the narrative thread in the book is that you have these idealistic academics, for the most part, working on this single idea, the idea of a neural network. And some of them worked on this for decades. And the acceptance of the idea would ebb and flow over the years. But there are certain people that just kept working on it, even in the face of everybody saying it would never work. And then it started to work. And it worked in an unexpected and incredibly rapid way. And once that happened, those idealistic academics were sucked into the machinery of some of the biggest companies on earth. And that's the narrative thread. Bengio wasn't one of those people who was sucked into it. He resisted that. He has worked with IBM on some level. He has worked with Microsoft on some level. For the most part, he remained an academic. And that's why there's less about him, because unlike Lacoon, unlike Hinton, and some of my other main characters, he stayed outside of that for personal reasons. And so that's why I focus on some people as opposed to others. Bengio, his area was natural language understanding, right? But his contribution was that alongside Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun and just a few others, that he kept working on this, that he was part of this research group that Jeff put together around 2005 or so that would continue to work on this idea, double down on this idea at a time when almost everyone else in the field had given up on it. And that's a big, big part of his contribution. There are some others that didn't give up on it, certainly, but those were the three that worked together in Canada, funded by the Canadian government, and that kept things going. And that's why people focused on him. Also, I wanted to keep the companies that I'm focusing on relatively small. Some other companies have gotten involved in this, of course. It's become a technology that is used by so many different companies to do so many different things. But there's a core group of companies that really jumped on this, really bet big on it. And so in addition to focusing on certain people, I wanted to focus on certain companies. You paint a very dramatic picture of the 
lease at all, competition with AlphaGo in Seoul. And as I say, you were in that documentary. A lot of these events, it sounds like you were there. When was your first contact with this world? First contact with the world was in 2013. The inflection point for the industry was what they now call the AlexNet paper, which was the image recognition paper that Jeff Hinton and two of his students, including Alex Krzyzewski, put together and published in in 2012. And that's when the industry really jumped on it. So in the wake of that, alongside my colleagues at Wired, that's when we started to to cover this. Some people really saw what was happening and really went after it before the press caught on, certainly. And we saw this, like as we started to cover this, there was even a lot of skepticism at Wired about whether or not this was really important, how much it really meant. As we continued to cover it and talked about how much success there had been with image recognition and and a little bit before that speech recognition. There were a lot of questions in the industry, in the academic world, the AI community about whether or not it would continue to progress, whether or not these same ideas would work well for natural language. And despite that skepticism, we continued to cover it. You could see a lot of the places this was going to go. And it has had a big effect on natural language and continues to have a big effect. And you can see the progress continue to happen in that area, in robotics. It's a huge part of the way self-driving cars are built. So that was our job at Wired, is to see these areas that were starting to bubble up and become important and then go after them. And that's what we did. But I have to say, it wasn't until Korea that even my organization really understood what was going on and really got behind it. That was an important moment, in part because it was something that everyone could grasp, right? People play games and they can understand a machine beating a human, one of the best humans on earth at a game. And that really crystallized it for a whole lot of people across the world. Just when it comes to me and my book and this beat, it was lucky because it was an astounding situation. I I, I tell people that that is one of the most, if not the most amazing weeks of my life. And I wasn't even part of it, right? I'm just a journalist covering it. It was incredible to watch really an entire country get wrapped up in this, this very human endeavor, this very human situation, despite the fact that a machine was also at the heart of it. It was an incredible thing to watch. And I feel really lucky that I was able to go and be there and then cover it. Yeah. And for listeners who who might not be following, that's 2016 when DeepMind's AlphaGo beat the world Go champion Lee Sedol in Seoul at the Four Seasons. When did you first meet Jeff? When did you first meet Demis Hasibus and the other characters in the book? Demis and I had spoken on the phone. You know, he's based in London. I was based in San Francisco. So we had spoken on the phone. I didn't actually meet him until I got to Korea. But one of the great things about being in Korea was spending more time with him. He, in a very different way from Jeff Hinton, is an incredible person. And he, alongside Jeff, is one of the two most important characters in the book. And again, I'm grateful I got to know him then, but it wasn't until then. And since then, I've gotten to London and and talked to him more depending on what's going on with the news and what's going on with DeepMind. We'll talk on the phone as well. But I could go on and on about him and and his unique contributions to this. But Jeff, I didn't even meet till later. Again, I talked to Jeff on the phone, but I didn't meet him until I think you and I met in Toronto. That was the first time I actually met him in the flesh. And since then, I've met him many times and have worked quite a bit with him as I put together the book, which I think, again, was essential to spend a lot of time with him and really understand who he is, in addition to talking to all the people he has influenced and who know him well over the years. Yeah. At Toronto, I've forgotten the name of that conference, but you and he were on the stage, I remember, and he used you as kind of an object lesson in explaining capsule networks. That's right. That's exactly right. As the book progressed, what I really enjoyed was meeting more of these folks in person in various places around the world. I did go to China when DeepMind then took AlphaGo, its GoPlane machine, to China. 
which is its own amazing story with an end result that is entirely different than Korea. An end result that I don't think anyone, including DeepMind and Google, expected. I think they expected a rerun of Korea, and that did not happen. And that, to me, is another fascinating part of of the book and, and where this narrative goes. Yeah, absolutely. I knew that they blocked out coverage of the tournament, but I had not heard the story of Eric Schmidt giving a speech, sort of patronizing the the Chinese and the reaction to that. That I found fascinating, particularly given Schmidt's work since then on getting the, the U.S. military and national security community organized and focused on competing with China. When did you start talking to Schmidt about all of this? Well, I was there in Korea for the speech. I did a lot of reporting around him, a whole lot of reporting, together with a very talented colleague of mine, Kate Conger, who's in the San Francisco Times Bureau with me. We built a big story on Schmidt. That was months and months in the works. And I mean, I think at one point you and I corresponded about this. We were really having trouble getting him to talk. But sometimes it's like that. You kind of build your story around your subject. You get the information you need. And they're almost the last person to talk to you. And that's what happened with this story. And once Kate and I got him to talk, we talked about all sorts of things, including that event in China. And he and I could kind of replay that from my perspective and from his perspective. And I just love that interview with him, a lot of which winds up in the book because he really acknowledges that he didn't quite see what was happening happening with the Chinese. Those who read the book will understand this more, but Google was going to China almost as a PR exercise, which Korea had been in spades, right, and a huge success. And they really saw this trip to China as a way of building goodwill there for various reasons, and it blew up on them. As you alluded to, someone in the Chinese government at the last second kind of brought the curtain down on this event, and it was supposed to be broadcast on TV and online. The last second, they put the kibosh on that. The Chinese journalists got an order, which you know I learned about while I was there that day, that they could write about it. But if they did write about it, they couldn't use the word Google in their stories. It was just a remarkable thing to see and to suddenly realize that the few people that were at this arena in the middle of this as they call it, water town in China, this ancient Chinese town where this thing was going on, we were the only ones that were really witnessing this within the country. No one else in the country could see it. It was, it was a remarkable thing to see. And it was a remarkable thing to see sort of Google push that aside and act like that hadn't happened and just continue with their event. There was a big conference in addition to a match. Again, I feel lucky to have been there and to have seen all that. Amazon plays a relatively small role in the book and the parts where it does appear you're fairly critical, particularly in discussing bias. Amazon is such a major player in this space. Is it because they came in late and have not been as instrumental in basic research? I don't think I'm critical of them. They show up in the story in a different way in the chapter about bias. I relate that story. I don't think that I am critical of them. But part of the reason they're a smaller player is that they responded to this very differently. When deep learning started to happen, Google, first of all, and then Facebook really bet big on it, which meant that they were going to spend whatever money they needed to buy the talent, the high profile talent in this area. I go into detail in the book about this, you know, just just how much Google bet on this and then Facebook behind them. Microsoft belatedly did something similar. There's some great stories in there about how they eventually say, wait, wait, these other guys have these big names. We've got to get the big name. Amazon's approach is different. They're outside of Silicon Valley. Their mindset is different. They don't necessarily want to make a splash with the big hire. Google and Facebook see the big hires as a way to attract other talent, as a way of generating PR. Amazon operates differently. They didn't go after those big names. They certainly started to use the technology. They didn't go after the big names, and they don't publish their research in the way a lot of these others do. And so they have a very different effect on the field. So they're not part of of the book as much because they're not as, as big of a part of my narrative for those reasons, right? The narrative is more about these companies that are really going after it. But Amazon uses all the same technologies and it comes with all the same pitfalls, including bias, including this face recognition question and all sorts of things. All these companies are caught up in those questions. 
On the question of bias, I was not aware of the anecdote of the intern at Clarify to whose attention this was brought when looking at Google search results. Was Clarify ahead in recognizing that problem of bias, or is that just an anecdote to illustrate that people were becoming aware of that problem? Part of it is that Clarify was founded by a key deep learning researcher who came out of Lacoon's lab and, and had connections, he interned at Google. So because of that, they're an important player and, and they kind of show a different path for this. I'm sure that there were other people noticing this. I've talked to people who noticed this, but the intern there went on to be an important force in the industry. And one of the people, as I discuss in the book, you know, started to call attention to this issue. Clarify came up also because like Google, they were involved in Project Maven, which was this effort to work with the government. So again, because they've got the talent and because they're working on these ideas, they are part of it. And it's a way into the industry and it certainly is part of the narrative, right? I try to show how these things bubble up at many different companies. And a lot of this stuff, it's brand new reporting. So that anecdote is new. And a lot of this is new. And what I want to do is peel back the curtain a little bit and show more of what really went on. And it's not just limited to face recognition, image recognition. You see similar issues in speech and certainly in natural language, right? Now we have these giant language models that learn their skills by analyzing enormous amount of human written text, right? So essentially you have these neural networks that look for patterns in this giant sea of self-published books and Wikipedia articles and all sorts of other stuff gleaned from the internet. Now, if you train on that, your language model, and these language models are used to drive chat bots and to drive the Google search engine. They can now generate their own language in other ways. They can generate tweets and generate blog posts. When they do that, inherently, they're going to show that type of bias and also spew toxic language, right? If you train on the internet, all that stuff is on there. So of course, your system's going to do that. The problem is, is that the amount of data needed to train these things is so enormous. How do you weed all that out? How do you balance it out? It's more data than we humans can wrap our brains around. It's a very difficult problem. And people are exploring and will continue to explore options there. There are ways of mitigating it. Google will certainly tell you that. But it's not a problem that can easily be weeded out just because of how complex it is. And the other thing we're starting to see is there are some people who argue it's not a problem. And so there's a clash there which has been surprising to a lot of people. It's a real conflict in the industry. Yeah, it's surprising how politicized the issue has made the AI world. The conferences have gotten very political over the diversity issue. You get into the AGI debate, which surprised me, partly because Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg are the standard bearers of either side of the debate, and neither of them is really an AI person. What's your view on that? It's an interesting debate, no doubt, but do you think it's a legitimate debate at this point? Well, it's very interesting, and you're right. There's a great scene in the book where Elon Musk and Mark and Zuckerberg actually meet and this gets discussed. What you find, and this is detailed in the book, is that there is a huge disagreement on this within the AI community. There is a growing group of people who believe that we are on the way to AGI. And this is centered around two labs, DeepMind and OpenAI. DeepMind being the first lab to spring up. And, and I go into how this idea kind of drove the creation of the company in a lot of ways. And if you talk to Demis and certainly to his co-founder, Shane Legg, and the third founder, Mustafa Suleiman, who's in the book as well, this is something they still talk about. This is what they're doing. They are building AGI. And in a lot of ways, OpenAI, the lab founded by Elon Musk and Sam Altman, who's also an incredible character in the book, and, and a guy named Greg Brockman, their stated belief is we are building AGI. Now, what I seek to do in the book is pick this apart a little bit and show people what's really going on. 
and that the reality is none of us knows what the future holds. Even the people who say they're building AGI, they don't necessarily have a path to get there, or at least not a path that they can they can articulate to you. There's so much that's unknown there. So we can all argue whatever we want. And I think that that's a fascinating dynamic. And it's really about a belief in what you're doing, right? And in a way, this is something that you see in Silicon Valley writ large. It's just the way that Silicon Valley works. You start a company and that company is not going to work unless you have a very serious belief that it will. And that's what drives the creation of a Facebook or, a, or some other tiny little app. And that dynamic is now being applied to AGI, which is an infinitely more difficult problem. It's fascinating to me that we're not even sure we can get self-driving cars to work at this point, despite all the hype. It's, a, it's such a difficult thing to do. And yet we're equally confident that AGI will work. You know, at the very least, this belief that AGI is around the corner is a real phenomenon that has a real effect on the industry. Yeah. My frustration is that it throws the specter out there and people latch onto it. When in fact, it's a philosophical debate. It's not a technological debate. And people don't understand that. So when they see Elon Musk warning about AI destroying humanity, and then they see other people saying, I believe we'll have AGI in five to 10 years, that freaks people out. When in fact, you and I know that there's a difference between machines that have human level intelligence in certain domains and machines that have free will, self awareness, and the ability to act on that self awareness. They're completely different things. You can talk about AGI as human level intelligence within the confines of a neural network, but to say then that it's able to build physical objects and control them and that sort of thing is into the realm of science fiction. So that discussion, just every time I see it, I find it frustrating that people that have a lot of credibility in society are undertaking it in kind of a cavalier way because it really creates so much misunderstanding. I see myself as a journalist who stays outside of this debate, including in the book. The aim is to lay the landscape out. But here's what I will say. You know, we have technology in play today that is so much simpler than the type of AGI that people aspire to that is creating huge problems in the world. That is not a secret. That is not news to anyone who has lived over the past five years, right? We have uh, what are relatively simple technologies that have resulted in huge amounts of turmoil. What happens as the technology gets more complicated and more effective? I think this is a better way to think about it. And this is in large part what the book is about, that as the technology progresses and gets more powerful, the issues we have to deal with become more serious. And so I almost want to step so far back from that debate about AGI to make that point. In a way, it's a metaphor. We're dealing with all this now. What's going to happen in the years to come as this technology progresses, even if it progresses at a much slower pace than a lot of these AGI folks think it will? So I think that there's a finer point to be made. Is there a reason why you stayed focused on supervised learning, didn't really address unsupervised learning, which people like Yann and Jeff Hinton are, are working on now? And is there a reason why you stayed away from reinforcement learning from the point of view of somebody like Rich Sutton, who might feel like, well, hey, where am I in this book? Reinforcement learning is actually a big part of the narrative, right? It's a big bet that DeepMind has made reinforcement learning drives AlphaGo. Reinforcement learning drives the robot work that I discuss at OpenAI and Covariant, which is Peter Abiel's company. In the end, Jeff Hinton sort of changes his mind about the technology. But the reason reinforcement learning has started to work in those areas recently is because of neural networks, right? You know, it's just another way for a neural network to learn. GPT-3 or Google BERT, which is discussed more in the book, these large language models that we talked about earlier, 
People talk about those as unsupervised, right? But really it's a neural network that's doing the work. It's not about whether or not you have to label the data or whether you don't. The progress is about the fact that it's a neural network. And that's part of what I wanted to do with the book is of course there are so many other areas of AI as people call it. There are so many other technologies that work well in certain areas. Deep learning only works in relatively narrow fields. That is certainly true, but that is where the big change has been. That is what has been different over the past 10 years. And that's what not only driving a lot of the progress, but it's driving a lot of the hype. And it's one of the reasons that we just talk about AI all the time. And absolutely, there are other ways of building computer technology and building what people call AI, and a lot of it works in so many ways that deep learning just cannot work, of course. But the major change over the past 10 years is that one idea. And the reason I focus on that idea is because that's what happened. And also, I want people to understand that, right? I want them to understand that it's this one thing that started to work, and it's working in these particular areas, and here's what it's actually doing. That's what you need to think about, as opposed to thinking about this AI term writ large. It is incredible when you think about it. It's less than 10 years since AlexNet, and it's already created entire industries and reshaped other industries. And I was talking to somebody recently who said that every company is going to be an AI company at some level, by which they mean a deep learning company. You're still very early in this evolution, and it's amazing that you were there really from the beginning. Are you expecting to follow this with other books? How do you see your focus on this unfolding story playing out? Well, I will certainly keep covering at the time. And I I think there's no shortage of stuff that needs covering right now. And I think that a lot of these ideas and a lot of these pitfalls that I've written about in the book just keep happening. I I think the stakes are going to get higher. I think in particular, questions around bias and toxicity, one way or another, that's going to have to come to a head right? That there is a huge amount of incentive to these companies to push that technology as far as they can. They're going to continue to push it. It is inherently biased and it spews toxic language. And there's no arguing that. And you can look at that however you want, but that is just the case. And so what's going to happen there? Microsoft put out its Taybot and within hours or minutes, even people realize that they can make it spew toxic stuff and Microsoft took it off the market. Well, Microsoft is OpenA is partner on GPT-3 and Microsoft wants to get GPT-3 out. So what happens? Honestly, I'm dying to see what, what happened. As far as another book, I've just got to find another good story and, and great characters. Because again, that's what made this book so much fun to work on. Well, there's no shortage of great characters in that world. That's it for this week's episode. I want to thank Cade for his time. You can find a transcript of this show on our website. That's eye-on.ai. I encourage everyone to pick up a copy of Genius Makers. It's both accessible and detailed and will be entertaining for anyone who already knows the people involved and deeply informative for those who don't know the story of AI today. And remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is about to change your world, so pay attention.